Hello, Oscillator Sync here. This is the Polyend Synth. The Synth is a digital polyphonic multi engine multi timbral electronic instrument. You can load up three different sounds, each using different synthesis engines, across this velocity and aftertouch sensitive grid. So, for example, here I've got this chord arpeggio thing happening in the yellow zone. Down here in the blue zone, I have a bass sound. Which I might latch that arpeggio going on there. In the purple zone, I have this kind of theremin sound. As well as this sort of keyboard layout in order to play the notes, there's also some sort of sequencing performance aspects where different zones can be set up as leaders and followers. So for example, my yellow zone is a leader, my blue zone will follow it, which means that I can free up a hand as I play different chords. Leaving me a free hand to play my theremin. In this video, I want to share some sounds and some thoughts about the synth. This isn't intended to be a tutorial. If there's demand for a tutorial, then please let me know in the comments and I'll certainly take a look at doing that. Instead, I want to just show you sort of what I've learned about synth over the last week and a bit. And, you know, talk about it a little bit. See what you think. Hello, Oscillate Sync from the future. I'm just in the middle of editing this video and I realized that I forgot to mention in the intro that in the interests of transparency, Polyen kindly sent the synth to me uh, to make some videos on. I haven't paid for it and I get to keep it. I uh, haven't otherwise been paid, but uh, that's obviously really important to disclose before we go any further in this video. Um, I think that's everything I needed to say. Uh, so back to the synth. The synth is based around this idea of scenes, and you can think of a scene as a preset for the overall state of the synth. The main thing that it contains is what presets you have loaded. So here, I have different uh, sounds loaded into the different areas of the grid. Speaking of the grid, it also uh, defines how the grid is laid out, and you can select different layouts. Uh, from presets here, depending on what you're trying to do. So if you just want kind of a three by three grid, I've used that one quite a lot. And as I'm building stuff, we have a nice three by three grid there, but we have other layouts which give priority to different uh, engines based on which ones are where. The one I want is back to this one here, which is called the beach. I guess. don't know what the purple is on the beach, but that's the beach. Uh, it also defines um, what scale the grids are uh, sort of locked to, if any, you can go to a sort of chromatic scale as well if you prefer. It defines the root note for them and also um, whether they are going to act as sort of note players or chord players. And finally, whether, um, as we saw in that intro jam, whether they're going to lead or follow chords that are being played. So I've got a chord on the purple and you can see as I play different chords, the other two grids are following what's going on in those chords. 
you can move between editing the different parts with these three buttons here. Um, so on this scene, I've got this bass sound, which is based around the two operator FM synth. Uh, I have this arpeggiator thing, uh, which is based on the phase distortion oscillator type. And down here I have this chord, sort of virtual analog. Very satisfyingly squidgy, the pads here, um, which is based around a sort of virtual analog, what's called the fat oscillator type. Um, in terms of the different uh, engines that we have in here, if we come into the engine select here, we've got various different um, flavors of virtual analog, the acid, fat, the VAP, um, those are all sort of virtual analog style uh, setups. We also have a wavetable in here, and there are multiple wavetables that you can load in, you can scan across them. We have the two operator FM, as I mentioned, uh, with feedback and a couple of other tricks in there to make it a little bit more um, versatile. Uh, we've got a um, phase modulation, as I mentioned, and then excitingly, we've got a physical modeling uh, oscillator type and also some grains, the old granular synth. Don't worry, we will dive into those in some of the other scenes uh, because they're very exciting to me uh, as well. In terms of the controls over the different engines that you have loaded in, um, on the engine button we have sort of the oscillator setup. So on the FM we've got the mm -hmm. ratios, how much FM is going on, various different shapes, feedback. Uh, some of these have multiple pages, most of them have multiple pages. Um, so here we've got fine tune, the reset of the oscillators, whether we're oversampling or not. And then we have some uh, portamento stuff here on the final page. We have control over filters, so the FM mode has a filter, for example, uh, which allows you to also uh, define different filter uh, models as well. So we have some sort of uh, standard uh, state variable stuff in here. Um, we have like an Oberheim style filter, a Mogi style filter. Not every single engine has access to all of those. It depends which engine you have loaded. We also then have a number of uh, envelopes. Again, this kind of depends on which of the engines you've got loaded, how many envelopes you have, and what they are sort of automatically routed to. So uh, we've got amp filter and an aux envelope here. I'm using the aux to define the um, FM amount, for example. Uh, we've got some LFOs, uh, typically two, although only one, on some of the engines, lots of different waveforms. There's a random in there, not a smooth random. I would like to see a smooth random in there, but you've got tempo sync in there. Uh, you've then got control over whether there is sequencing, arpeggiation, uh, or, or nothing at all going on that track, and that also plays into some of the following stuff as well. Uh, you edit by using these knobs here. So on this particular scene, um, I've just put the uh, arpeggiator back on uh, for this one. And here when I squidge down, we're getting some interesting modulation going on. And that's all defined via uh, the macros. Um, so you have these three uh, nobular macros which you can define uh, but you also have uh, macros in the menu here for velocity, aftertouch and uh, pressure. Uh, these are really easy to uh, assign. You basically go to an, sorry, <laughs> it's very nice to squish, an empty slot, select a parameter and then go to one of the pages, turn the knob that you want to assign and uh, that will add it to the, um, add it to the macro and then you can uh, adjust the amount. Um, that's really, really easy to do. Um, it uh, also has a mod matrix here, which weirdly compared to the macros feels a bit limited in some places. Um, you don't have the full range of destinations in the same way that you do with the macros, which seems like an odd choice, but uh, that's how it is at the moment. I have fed back to Polyen that I think you should have more in the destinations here. But here, for example, we can see that my envelope aux is going to the FM with some amount. 
Which is what's given us that uh, in there. So as I mentioned, we have this sort of follower leader thing going on here where this purple chord track is controlling how the others are all working. So maybe we can latch some keys for the overall um, setup here which gives you control over the level and panning of each of the different parts so perhaps I think that my bass is maybe a little bit too loud we can bring it down on the second page uh, here we have control over how much is going into the uh, effects sense. So we have uh, effects for sort of modulation, which is a time-based thing where you can do flanging and chorus. We have delay and we have reverb. You can see at the moment I'm absolutely drenching everything in everything. But perhaps I thought I didn't want to have quite so much uh, chorus on the bass. We can turn that down dry it out a bit. Or add some more. Yeah, nice. Uh, the effects here are actually a lot more uh, controllable than they were on, uh, say, the play. Um, a lot easier to control as well. So you have uh, a generic kind of mod, a delay, and a reverb, and you have control over a bunch of different things in here. You have control over the uh, model that's being used. So I've got a nice stereo one at the moment. We have control over things like mod depth, mod freak, time shift. Uh, this allows you to set up flanging and uh, chorusing, depending on how the uh, time shift and the feedback is set up, kind of. Uh, the delay, uh, we have control over the things you would expect to see. Um, there's tempo sync, which I've got turned on here. Uh, we've got filter for the uh, feedback. Of course, feedback as well. So we can get into that rollover feedback if we want. And we also have the reverbs. I think the reverbs sound pretty good. Uh, we have different models here. This one's the warp, which has kind of got a modulation on it. And we've got the sort of controls you'd expect to see. So if time is the decay time, size is how big the virtual room is. control over geometry which changes how the reflections move diffusion is diffusion we can set it down if we want more of a echoey reverb rather than a smooth one and filter as well i think they generally sound pretty good uh, my only complaint with the uh sorry let's change the chord <laughs> my only complaint with the uh delay is that the flutter here is just way too brutal like anything above about two percent just sounds warped and broken how these chords are assigned is based in the grid menu as well and they're based um well they can be done one of two ways um the way i've got it at the moment is set in the chord pack mode which um basically allows you to load from a different um, uh, set of predefined chords which is why we don't really have a clear following here there are also scale chords where you can define a um, uh, define an interval or a set of intervals a chord type and then it will sort of move it through the degrees of the scale and then you also just have straight up intervals you can define as well. I'm hoping that Polyan give us a 
good way to edit these chords because I would like to be able to define these because you could use these to basically define a song structure and have everything else follow. some fairly conventional sounds. Let's try something uh, less conventional. So when I first saw the specs of the synth, the thing that immediately got me excited, that caught my eye, was the fact that we had this expressive, velocity-sensitive, aftertouch-sensitive playing surface that could be paired with a physical modelling sound engine. Because on paper, that makes for a very exciting proposition, for me, anyway. Now lots of other engines and we're going to dig into the granular one as well in another scene um shortly but i i feel like we should dig into the physical modeling just a little bit uh because i think we all have a fairly good idea of how virtual analog synths uh synth engines work and there's a few of them in here the fm and the phase modulation they might be worth exploring a bit more but maybe in another video but do you want to talk about these patches here um, to see what makes them tick. So the physical modeling engine is basically made up of two things. You've got a exciter, that's the thing that is somehow exciting the, the other part, the resonator, the thing which is being resonated and that sort of gives the body of the sound. And the way I've got um, these patches set up, each of these three uh, patches kind of make use of a different form of excitation that we can take a look at. So here on the blue side, this is mostly based around the strike part here. You can see that the strike level is turned up, the other two, the bow and air, are turned down. If we uh, look in the macros here for velocity, we can see that two things are being affected by the velocity. The volume of the exciter so that's essentially how hard we are hitting the resonator in this case and also this timbre which affects kind of the hardness of the material of the uh, strike so the moment as i hit it harder it kind of sounds like the material is harder but in turn it up just to take a look it gets more sort of clicky Essentially, I think that's just a bandpass filter being swept across. It's quite effective for getting different flavours of sound. The final control here, Mallet, um, changes the um, material, the structure of the thing that's doing the striking, also its kind of behaviour. So at the moment, the fact that we're getting this sort of ricocheting 
off the resonator is down to this mallet control. If I turn it up a bit more, we get even more. Like we're dropping a very bouncy ball on the surface. As we turn it down, it becomes less bouncy. In other places on the mallet control, So in the middle here we kind of get a just a straight strike. As we go down, we kind of get this almost like drag strike. It's kind of hitting it with like a brush or something instead. It's really interesting. And then down near the bottom we kind of get a similar kind of scraping, kind of a bit like our ricocheting but scraping instead. So quite a lot that we can get out of there. As it happens, I also, in the aftertouch here, I have a bow level set here, so actually, we'll get to the bow in a second, but as I press down harder, if I want to sustain the sound, I can send a bow across it as well. On the other two, we have the other two things. We have the air. This is something being blown, essentially. Similar sorts of ideas. We've got a level here. We've got this uh, timbre, which again is kind of going to change the frequency content of the air and then this airflow control which kind of changes the character of the air in the same way as that mallet did um, and what I've done is I've got that assigned assigned to the aftertouch which allows me to sort of like put other puffs of air into the resonator, which is really cool. I think the other thing that I've got on the aftertouch, uh, if I remember rightly, is, yeah, I've got some stuff happening in the resonator, including uh, sort of tuning it a little bit sharp as I press down, which is kind of what you would get if you were overblowing a, um, a wood, uh, woodwind instrument or another wind instrument. On the purple side, we've got the bow, which is kind of a shaped noise excitation. A bit more simple, we don't have the third parameter for this one, we just have a timbre control, which is again, kind of affecting the frequency content of the, of the uh, excitation. I seem to remember that that is being uh, modulated maybe? No, not on this one. Okay, um, so um, over here on the resonator, uh, which one is it easier to show this with? Probably this one. We have uh, a bunch of different um, controls which all affect the timer of the resonator. So form is the kind of the biggest change, I think, because that changes the relationship between the resonating filters, I think it's a comb filter, and completely changes the sort of harmonic structure of it. I've got it down at the bottom of this one. Our position is um, where on the resonator we are striking. That one has a, a more of an obvious effect, maybe on this bow one. Kind of hear this sort of almost flanging. But it changes the balance between the different frequencies.
Uh, damping works in kind of the opposite way you would uh, assume. Uh, if you turn it down, things are damped a lot more. We kind of get more woody sounds. Get sort of more metallic and glassy as we go up. And 100% it goes on for a long time. And is liable to overdrive with the air and the bow. Brightness is, brightness as you would kind of expect. Space and array uh, are really interesting. Uh, so space kind of gives you a spreading out of the different parts of the resonator. We turn down the effects, it'll be easier to hear. Uh, so if I just turn down the effects. Yeah, there we go. So down to zero. All in the middle. And the different parts of the resonator get spread out as we turn up space. Array uh, introduces additional uh, overtones on top of the fundamental. Getting more glassy as we go up to the top. You then have control over the um, exciter envelope. So, if, uh, for example, here on the purple one, I am having a longer attack so that we kind of have that sort of bowed in sound. It does drop down a little bit after time. You also have an aux envelope to do other things in the mod matrix. Uh, and mod matrix has control over a bunch of the parameters in the uh, exciter and resonator. Uh, but I'm doing most of the work, I think, um, in the uh, macros for aftertouch and velocity. So I'll just reload that um, to get everything back where it was. Uh, it has to be said that the uh, effects are doing a lot of work here as well. Um, there is a lot of delay and reverb going on. Uh, there's some delay happening on the yellow uh, channel. Lots of reverb. Over here on the purple. On the uh, blue I've got quite a lot of modulation but it's not really set up to be a chorus it's more like a short flangey comb filter thing so if I turn it up a bit more kind of here it's that sort of flangey short delay sound in there which you can absolutely set up by adjusting that time shift parameter That's a lot of fun. Yeah, you can get pretty weird with the granular engine here. So, um, here's three sets of granular engines set up to be not entirely 
normal. But I really like the granule engine in here. So let's take a quick look at it. That's tickling my ears in a nice way. I'm <laughs> sorry. Um, so um, the granular engine um, allows you to load in various different uh, samples, which you can just stick on an SD card. Um, really easy to get these samples into the synth. And then you have a, a bunch of controls over how those samples are played back. I think for maybe for this one, we will change to an initialized scene just so we can hear things a little bit more clearly. I'm also going to set the grid up to just be the blue engine. Okay, cool. Uh, come into here and set our engine to the grain engine. Just an initialized patch. Uh, let's see what we've got. Yeah, that's that's fine. So I'm just gonna turn a bunch of stuff down. Uh, yeah, there we go. That will do. So uh, before we jump into uh, the controls here in a lot of depth, the one thing I will point out before we get going any further is that the granular engine can be set to work uh, paraphonically. So you can lock it to be just one voice of polyphony, but then play multiple notes in on that single, um, that single voice. Uh, which uh, allows you to get a bit more out of uh, the engine without using up lots of voices. So um, the controls that we have here, we have the um, sample that we've loaded in. I'm just gonna stick with the one that we've got here. Uh, then you've got kind of the basic controls, which are the, the possession of the grains. The size of the grains the density of the grains how many grains there are and also the shape of the grains this is all in the mode called uh, cloud there's also this burst mode which has some more controls over here we have uh, controls for the burst frequency uh, which can be synchronized or not and also how those bursts should be um, re-triggered um, on note is probably the most useful one. Uh, one shot will only trigger it once, so you can kind of use this as sample playback, sort of. And then you've got free running, which means that you could play a note part way through uh, a burst. You get a course. Modulate this as well. If you wanted to. I'm going to come back into the cloud mode though. So on top of those basic controls, you have controls to randomly modulate a bunch of those controls. So we have position spread here, which will randomly change where in the sample we're grabbing our grains from. We have time spread, which modulates when 
those grains are going to be fired out. We have pan spread, which will pan those grains around. We have detune spread, which will change the tuning of each of the grains. We have size spread, which will change the size of the grains. We also have this space control, which kind of smears the playback of the grains to give you a pseudo reverb. We also have direction, um, which I didn't address previously because it's kind of more like these spread controls. At 100% positive, the grains will always play forwards. At 100% negative, they will always play backwards. As you put it anywhere in the middle, you apply a bias to some randomness which chooses per grain whether to play it backwards or forwards, with zero meaning an even chance of forwards or backwards. You then, of course, have your standard filtering. And we could maybe start applying some LFO. To say, uh, the density, maybe. And then you drown it in reverb, of course. And then probably modulate the filter cut off, I guess. sort of thing. And then you'd probably add a macro for aftertouch on that filter cutoff as well. send your amp envelope to be a longer release. sort of thing. But yeah. You can also do it. With other types of samples. If you want to make more experimental sounds. It's extreme. 
extremely satisfying to give it a good old squidge. I do like a synth that you can squidge. as such on the channel because I think there are just people out there that do it a lot better than I can. I prefer to demo things, do tutorials, that sort of thing. That's what I've done for this video. I've shown you stuff that I like about synth. Uh, but I do recognise that I'm in an extremely privileged position where given that I have an audience, stuff that I say or show people may influence purchasing decisions in a time where money is especially tight for a lot of people. So I think it is important to provide a little bit of balance and level some criticisms at this instrument because it is not flawless. And very few instruments are, though. Before I do so, I do want to provide a little bit of counterbalance to that. Uh, two things, really. The first is that I genuinely have really enjoyed using this instrument something about the combination of the sounds, the playing interface, and the form factor which allows me to just sort of sit in bed and noodle on it. Also, the fact that it takes USB-C, I can just use a little power bank. And genuinely, there have been in the weeks that I, the week and a bit that I've had it, times where I've started playing with it in the evening and then I've looked at the clock and it's suddenly like, 1 a.m. half 1 in the morning or something and the time has just melted away because I've just enjoyed playing it. The other thing that I want to say before I start piling negativity uh, onto the synth <laughs> is that although I've only had it for just over a week um, I've been providing feedback to and the whole time I found uh, some bugs I made some suggestions and uh, they have A been very receptive to the suggestions that I've been making which is I think a good sign uh, but also uh, where I found some of the uh, bugs they have issued new firmware within a day of me reporting the bug and it's been fixed. There was a big issue with the way that the reverb behaved in some cases, for example, that was um, that was fixed. So I do sort of hold out hope that when I talk about some of these downsides, if you like, that a lot of them will be addressed. That being said, there's one big sort of elephant in the room, I think, for most people. Uh, and for other people it might not be a deal breaker but it's worth mentioning that the polyphony on synth is set at eight notes and it can actually be lower if you're using some of the engines the physical modeling for example takes up essentially additional polyphony slots and that's eight notes across the entire instrument that has to be shared between the different engines and that is pretty low for certain types of playing, right? Now, if you're expecting to do big held pads, for example, eight might feel a bit limiting. On the other hand, I then have to sort of check myself and say that, okay, well, one of my favorite synths in the world is the 
original digger tone and that only has eight notes you can do more things with the sequencer with that which is kind of important which kind of gets more out of those eight notes of polyphony but you know a juno only has six so i don't think this is really designed to be a big keyboard synth where you're doing big lush chords where that sort of polyphony would impact you but for some people that might be a deal breaker so it's important to kind of mention it it doesn't really bother me i don't think i'm not really a keyboardist something which i have a stronger opinion on is that oh, i don't think you would have seen it in this video it is possible to get a cpu high and cpu overload warning uh, while you're doing uh, stuff on synth it tends to be associated more with things like the physical modeling and the granulator although i have seen it with the fat uh, synth engine as well And I have a strong opinion on that. Yeah. One of the things that draws me to hardware is that it is self-contained and I don't need to worry about kind of resourcing a computer like you would with a virtual instrument. Like I accept that sometimes when you're using virtual instruments, you might overload, might have to freeze a track or something. I don't think a piece of hardware should be allowed to get itself into a state where you have CPU overload like it doesn't sit well with me I don't like seeing it and uh, that's really the only thing that has truly bummed me out about the synth while I've been using it um, when I got it the pads behaved really weirdly with velocity a lot of that was to do with the way that the patches, the factory patches and the initialized patch was set up, uh, which has been uh, resolved. Uh, they've also uh, changed the velocity curve a little bit, which makes it feel much more comfortable to, to play. So I don't find that to be an issue at all now. But I thought I'd mention it because if other people are making videos on it who haven't got a more up-to-date firmware, they might still be thinking that the velocity feels mad. Uh, a few other things um, that I'd like to see improved. These are less out and out gripes and more sort of, I think, room for improvement. I think I mentioned uh, previously that the mod matrix sometimes feels a bit restrictive because you don't have like a full set of destinations. For example, you don't have panning as a mod destination. And I think that's mad with a synth which does these sorts of analog soundscapes so nicely. Um, I also don't know why the interface for the mod matrix is so different to the interface that we see with the macros where you have the sort of select slot, press select parameter and wiggle a knob. That just seems like a much more uh, intuitive way of doing things rather than having to scroll through different potential destinations and not having all of them here. I also feel like there are engines which could really do with uh, ways to dirty up the sound a bit more. Some of the filter models sound a little bit dirty, but like not out and out filthy. I, I think that the uh, physical modeling and the acid mode in particular could really benefit with like actual filth that you can dial in, especially stereo filth if at all possible. Uh, on the physical modeling side of thing, um, distortion after a lot of these sounds sound incredible so i'd really like to see that in there i think there's a good range of engines i think there's also kind of uh places that it could go beyond where it is currently i would like for example to see a straight up sample player you can kind of fake it with the uh granular mode with the one shot burst but it's not quite the same thing i don't think i think just a straight up sample player would be really really welcome with all your sort of start position end position controls i 
there are probably other minor things that I can think of, but those are the things that kind of jump to mind. I don't think any of them are insurmountable. I think a lot of them can be addressed via um, firmware updates. Um, oh, yeah. No smooth random on the LFO is also unforgivable, so that needs sorting out as well. I want to reiterate, though, even with those criticisms, I've really enjoyed using it and playing it. Who and what it's actually for is maybe difficult to necessarily define, but I think I find it to be an especially pleasant noodling synth, right? As I say, it's form factor, it's tactile nature. Just makes it really nice to just use and noodle and maybe work out ideas. I think there's also a place with the sort of performance oriented uh, side of thing for sort of jamming. And arguably having the physical modeling in there and having this sort of tactile surface does make it pretty compelling, kind of just on that basis for me, just because I love physical modeling since, but I know not everyone has that same opinion. Anyway, I think that's everything I wanted to say. If you're interested in a more in-depth exploration of some of the functionality and especially the sound design, then let me know in the comments because I'd be happy to take a look. Otherwise, I think it's probably time to say goodbye for this video. So if you did enjoy the video, then as always, a like and subscribe is massively appreciated. The algorithm uh, hates it when I do weird stuff and punishes me forever and ever. And that just helps re-establish my, <laughs> my place in the algorithm's heart. Makes the graph go up in the analytics, which spikes the dopamine in my brain just long enough. So if you could do me that favour, that would be massively appreciated. Other than that, till next time, thank you so much for watching. Take care.